The story of how a man named Saul became the Apostle Paul is an amazing one. Hear him share that story with his young protege in today's scripture reading, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 12 through 17. Now hear the word of the Lord. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal and visible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. That's pretty good. Well, good morning. Uh, just before we... Uh, get to our text for the day. I wanted to take a moment since this is the first time I've had the opportunity to thank you all for uh, for welcoming me here and, and making me feel so welcome during this our homecoming month. Uh, especially all of you who uh, were at the cookout last week um, or the carry-in. Thank you for bringing the food. Now we're doing that again this week, right? I mean, is that? <laughs> sure. I can't blame a guy for trying. Um, but it is good to be with you. I I was talking about, uh, this was someone this morning, but I've been living in Kentucky for three years, and so it's good to be back someplace where, um, oh, wrong way. It's good to be back in the region of the country where my IU gnome can be safe in my front yard. Um, this, is, this is actually a picture in front of my house in Kentucky when I got back, upside down in the, in the flower. And so I think, I think that, so I, I really am glad to be here, and uh, I appreciate the way you all made me feel so welcome. So, um, would, you, would you pray with me? God, you are so very good, and it is a, a privilege to, to worship you. And we pray that uh, today you would, you would come in and you would, you would change our hearts, so we might leave different and better people. More like you than we really can. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, so, one of my all time favorite sports movies, and you guys are going to get the impression that I'm a big sports fan, that would be a mistake. Don't, don't think that. Um, one of my all time favorite sports movies is the movie Rudy. I don't know how many of you have seen this anyone? Okay. I, I felt really old when I realized that it was, it was 20 years old. I thought, I'm getting old. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Rudy is one of my all-time favorite sports movies. And the reason that is, is because Rudy for me demonstrates an absolute passion for one thing. He, if you've seen the movie, you know that it's a movie about a man named Rudy Rudiger who wants to play for the Notre Dame football. He wants to play for the Fighting Irish more than anything in the world. And so he gives up everything. He gives up his job, his his house, his family, his, uh, all of his money. Um, he, he lives basically homeless and functions as a, what amounts to a practice dummy uh, for about three and a half years so that he can play in one game and one play of his senior year. Because this is the, his all-consuming passion, his passion that consumes him more than anything. I mean, he can't hardly introduce himself without talking about his desire to play football for another day. And so that's why I like it, just this this demonstration of an absolute passion that focus on one thing that you have to understand to understand everything else that he does. In our passage today, Paul is telling us, Paul is telling Timothy through his own personal testimony, he's describing his one true passion, the thing that drives him beyond anything else, which you have to understand to understand everything that Paul says and does. So this, this passion, this, this um, driving force that Paul reveals in his testimony is holiness. It's seeing lives transformed 
by the, by the grace of God, such that their thoughts, words, actions, and the very wills are, are governed by being conformed to the image of Christ. And, and so that people are not only forgiven from their sins, but free from them. So Paul is writing to Timothy. Uh, this is he's the leader of the congregation in Ephesus. And Paul's not been there for many years. And so he's writing, I don't know if you, many of you are familiar with the book of 1 Timothy, but it includes a lot of instructions on this. You know, do this, don't do this, I want you to do this, don't do it this way, don't forget about that other thing. It's a lot of kind of instructions like this. It's about the business of running the congregation. And so before Paul gets to all this, before he gets to all the business of running the congregation, he's telling Timothy, I need you to understand this about me. I need you to understand this message. This is what we're about. Uh, the transformation of people's lives. Um, and so this is Paul's one driving passion that he's sharing. Incidentally, and perhaps appropriately, uh, this is a passion which I share. And it's what drives me to be in ministry, to be in ministry here with, with you all. Um, it, it truly is a great privilege to be able to, to, be able to announce the good news of freedom from the bondages of sin and the transformation that is part of life as being a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. Um, now, if you've read the book of Acts, you, you know that Paul's not really exaggerating about, about, his, about how, just how bad he really was. I mean, when Paul was Saul, he was one bad dude. He was... Um, as he mentioned just here, he was a blasphemer. He was actively denying the work of Christ. He was uh, a persecutor, condoning and participating in the, the, the killing of Christians. Uh, he was denying Christ. He was, I mean, he was, he was, he was a violent man, uh, abusing whoever possible that would get in his way. In Acts chapter 7, he, he was listed as a participant in uh, killing Stephen, the very first Christian martyr. And he did all this while he was, uh, while he thought he was serving God when he was doing this. And only later did he realize, after Christ met him on the road to Damascus and he was transformed, uh, only after did he realize that he was actually serving himself. So but what Paul tells us in, in this passage, in his testimony to Timothy in the Ephesian church, is that there is a work of grace which Christ can do that can take this blasphemer, persecutor, and violent aggressor and change him into someone we call St. Paul, who is considered one of the apostles, who wrote half of the books of the New Testament. Paul did everything that, that he could to oppose the church, putting Christians in prison, persecuting them, killing them, hunting, traveling to other cities to hunt them down. And what he's telling us here is that there is a work of grace which Christ can do that can transform that man into the man who first took the gospel to Rome and made possible the spread of, a, of the gospel throughout Europe. And then from there, the, the evangelism spread from there to North America and to the rest of the world. And, and so in a very real way, we're sitting here in this room as a result of what God did through this transformed violent aggressor. So the man who did everything he could to oppose the church has a church down the street named after him. <laughs> this is quite an awesome work of God's grace uh, to cause this kind of transformation. But it's important to realize that it was not that Paul was already faithful. He was chosen and then transformed. He was made holy for this task. It was not that Paul was worthy, but in God's choosing him, God made him worthy. Amen. If you were here last week, you remember Pastor Perry saying very this nearly this very same thing, when he says that uh, it's, it's not that we need to clean ourselves up to come to Christ, but that when we come, Christ is willing and able to free us from the sins of which we are ashamed. Thank you, Jesus. So Paul's entire orientation of life was changed by this work of Christ in his life, from being, from being a, uh, uh, governed by disobedience and sin and rebellion and bondage, uh, to be governed by love and obedience and freedom. It, it's like those, the, uh, the Eucharist liturgy that we say every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. What, what do we pray? We, we ask 
We say, Lord, free us for joyful obedience. But this is what happened in Paul's life. And when it happened, it was not that he became um, more, uh, he became more Christ-like, more godly, but it wasn't that he became less human. He, in fact, he became more human because he became what he was really meant to be. He became what God had originally intended for him. So in this transformation, then, it's a, it's a, to a holy life, it's not something we can produce in ourselves, just like Paul could not produce it. But this is where Paul gets a little bit, he starts to step on our toes a little bit. This is where it's like, watch it, Paul. He, he says, he, he seems to indicate in this testimony, in his testimony, that, um, that we also need this transformation. He says that in verse 15, he says, uh, this is a trustworthy saying, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if you were to stop there, he would kind of leave us with him, in, in a way, an us and them kind of thing. So it, it's, you know, that's, you know, Christ came for the sinners, you know, those people out there, you know, us here were fine. <laughs> um, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't make that distinction. He, he, he says, uh, Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost of all. And so he includes himself in there kind of by implication. He includes all of us as those as being the sinners. We were the sinners for whom Christ came along with everyone else. Um, I heard it once said that, that, uh, that, uh, that, you know, discipleship is simply one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And so we're all on that path of journey. That's what Paul is kind of telling us here. So Christ... Um, so, but, but, okay, so when, when Paul tells us, he tells us not only that, uh, that we need this transformation, but he tells us that it's possible. Uh, Paul talk, makes clear when he talks about the abounding grace being much more than sufficient uh, to, to perform this kind of, this work of transformation. So truly God's grace is sufficient to transform any of us in this room. Uh, no matter what we may think we have done or, or the things that weigh us down, Christ is willing and able to free us from those things. Amen. And, and to do with us far more than we could possibly think or imagine. So Christ can do far more than forgive us from our sins. He is willing and able to free us from them. So that like Paul, our very desires, our, our, our will, our entire orientation to life can be changed. And this really is the beauty of the gospel. Because it's, it's a far more beautiful thing to be free from our sins than simply forgiven. Uh, though, though being forgiven is quite a wonderful thing. Um, because if, if, if all Christ did when he came was free us, or forgive us from our sins, then this is like polishing our chains and leaving us in them. Um, but fortunately, what Paul demonstrates by the example of his own life is that this is not what Christ came to do. He came to do much more. So the grace of God so reoriented Paul's heart that he no longer desired the things which he desired before. And he was, in fact, a new creation. And Paul continues on telling us the, uh, the, the reason for this transformation was so that God could use the example of his holy life to be a witness to others who have yet to believe. Paul tells us this is what's necessary for the transformation of the world. Amen. This is the way in which we will reach the world for Jesus Christ. By evidence provided by our lives, lived out in holiness in front of our, in front of our neighbors. But what is needed to evangelize our neighbors is the witness provided by our lives, which have been transformed and lived out in holiness in front of our neighbors, co-workers, friends, classmates, and anyone else that we might interact with. I think, I think what Paul would tell us uh, here in Richmond is that if we are to if we're to reach Richmond with the love of Jesus, then it can only happen through this means, through the means of uh, the example of holy living of what God and living out what God is doing in our lives. And I've only been here a couple of weeks, but I can already tell that that God is using the witness of our lives lived out in front of others. And I I, I really think that, that God wants to use us even more. Um, Amen. But it can only come as an overflow of what God is doing in our lives and out of a deep sense of who we are and what Christ has done for us. And so I, I love the way that Paul ends this passage. Because after reciting the work of God in his life and, and how God wants to use that as an example for others, 
Paul has what can only be described as an outburst of praise. He says, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible God, be honor and glory forever and ever. This can be the only appropriate response after, after, uh, after hearing of this transforming work in his life and then the way God desires to use that with others. And I don't know all of your stories here in this room, but um, I'd like to. Uh, but in a room this size, I can, I can pretty well guess that, that this is the reason that, that a good number of us are here today is because Christ has so transformed our hearts and freed us from bondage to sin and bondage to guilt and anything else and made us a new creation, and that's why we're here, is to praise Him because of it. Um, so Paul's, Paul's response here in this, in this outburst of praise illustrates what one of my favorite seminary professors said uh, all the time. He said, God wants us, and worship is the way God wants us. And I thought, that doesn't make any sense. I really didn't understand. Well, I wasn't sure what he was meant at first. But then until I understood what worship was, I realized it's, it's communication with God. It's uh, made possible through the work of Christ in our lives. We're drawn into worship. Um, and, and because of what he's done. And this, this is what we see lived out in Paul's testimony, being drawn into worship because of what Christ has done and wants to do through us. So it's, it's when we experience transformation in our hearts and we're empowered for holy living in a way that we, we become an example for our neighbors and we're all drawn into worship together. That's, that's when we become who we're really meant to be. We come into relationship with God and our neighbor the way we were meant to be in relationship with God and our neighbor. And when this happens, what really happens is what we've been talking about all month long. And that's, we come to a place where we're meant to be, and we can truly be home. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.